Hello, everybody. Welcome to our third and final session for the day. Uh, Sebastian Graf is going to be presenting on the core optimization pipeline of GHC, including the simplifier. Um, he's been a big contributor to GHC for quite some time now. He's a PhD student at Karlsruhe. I, I'm terrible at German pronunciation, sorry. It was perfect. Yes. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, <laughs> I get this inferiority complex with, uh, <laughs> yeah. Anyways, um, so and in addition to being a prolific GHC contributor and working in things like static analysis and optimizations and pattern match coverage checking, he's also helped out with teaching the functional programming class. So uh, warm welcome to Sebastian. Yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. So, um, as David said, I'm a PhD student and, well, most of my research boils down to, well, tweaking GHC and shaking it so much that the paper falls out of it and uh, hopefully the papers will eventually fall out. So, <laughs> um, right. So, um, as such, I'm quite battle proven, have become a bit battle proven over the years. So, um, at least what GHC's core pipeline is concerned. And, well, um, so I'll give you a quick tour around this. Um, so, what we, we, what we will focus on is what I call the middle end, right? So, we've just heard um, a talk about the, the front end, one pass in the front end named the renamer. We are now focused on the middle end, which is after we have desugared our uh, Haskell code into core, which is a declarative and typed language that uh, lends itself well to optimization passes. Right, so for a quick structure of, of this talk, basically is um, the first two points mean that I'll try to con convey the, the concepts um, between or in GHC's core pipeline. There will, won't be much code, not much implementation code anyway. We will review a bit of um, Haskell examples and dive into core as needed. In the first part, we will actually get to know core a bit more, especially with respect to getting a feel for how fast something executes and where we can improve. In the second part, we will go over each core optimization that runs when you type 01 or 02 into your compiler. In the third part, we will actually have a little hands-on session and we will try to improve the common sub-expression elimination pass. Uh, there's a neat little issue here, seemingly neat, um, that we can try to solve. All right, so the first part is about understanding, um, getting to know GHC core. So um, who of you has seen and heard si Simon's talk from, from last year's Zurich? Oh. Wow, yeah, that's quite a few. I, I would say about two-thirds. Well, um, you can probably sleep through this first part. I don't know. But um, pay attention when I ask a question. So, um, <laughs> right. So, um, what is core? Or when do we get core? So, um, a quick recap. We start with this huge, implicitly typed language that is easy to write for users and boil it down in a, in a process named the sugaring, which is implemented in this module here, we boil it down into this very much smaller data type, and which must, of course, be equally expressive, but, well, it turns out because you sugar stuff and you reuse much of the same constructors, it will be much more ver wordy in turn. The appeal of having such a small language is, of course, that we don't have to think about the whole syntax. In our passes, we can just know how to optimize these guys well and have a fast program in the end. Right, another fundamental difference is that this program or this syntax here is explicitly typed. What that means we will see in a second. Now, uh, let us see how desugaring works by a concrete example. Um, consider this sum of function here, which simply sums off the first n integers, right, for the parameter n. Um, this desugars into a core program that looks like this. Now, how did I get this desugared core form? Well, I passed, I in, in invocated GHC with the minus d dump ds flag, which means give me the core after desugaring. I also passed minus d no typable binds because it omits some uh, bindings generated for typable instances. 
as well as minus D suppress all, which suppresses type information as well as ID info. Um, you can figure out or read up on all these dump flags here, right? And uh, that's something I would do whenever the amount of information you get is too large or too less, which might be due to minus D suppress all that you pass, right? So you can tweak this very much uh, by picking the right flags. All right, so consider this program here. If I leave off the minus D suppress all, I get a bit more blown up information. Um, you will note that the, the first thing that is interesting here is that we have explicit, explicit type annotations, right? We've also got these ID info here that um, we'll introduce by example later on. So this is basically meta information that the compiler can exploit, attach and exploit in its core passes. Now, what we've got here is a lambda expression, as you may have guessed. The interesting part here is that it's also explicitly typed, right? So every binder, like the lambda binder here, which the B here is instantiated to var, as you can see, carries an explicit type. This type is, in, is stored in st inside the var data structure that you may recall from, from Sam's talk earlier. Um, yeah, so this is what a variable occurrence looks like. This variable occurrence of n occurs inside an application to plus. You know that these applications are all in prefix form, of course, because, well, the number of arguments to plus also increase from 2 to 4, if you compare it to the uh, Haskell, link, uh, Haskell source code. Now, um, an interesting aspect of core is that you've got these type applications, which occur whenever you have polymorphic functions, right? Um, this stems from its heritage from system F. And well, basically explicitly typed and polymorphism means that you've got to pass around type arguments in a first class way, just like you would pass around value arguments. Similarly, at this point, type class methods and type classes have been desugared to explicit dictionary passing. Uh, these bindings here, this, this corresponds to the num instance for int, and well, they are generated while type checking, I guess. So you see, I'm, I'm a core guy, <laughs> I no, don't normally think about type checking. For me, the types are God-given. <laughs> right, so <laughs> uh, another round, uh, we, we haven't talked about case yet, so what's interesting about the case at core level is that it's a very restrict, restricted form, right? So case and core matches exactly one level of a data type. It does so by first evaluating what is called the scrutiny expression. This is the guy between the case and the off. And when it had, has evaluated the scrutiny expression, it binds the, the returned value, the weak hat normal form, uh, to what is called the case binder. I highlighted it in gray here. So this case binder business in gray, normally they aren't displayed when they are dead. And in this case, this wild binder is how they are often named. In this case, this wild binder is dead, so it is omitted from the actual output. Uh, in this case, the case expression is for a data type, and th the case expression is the only way, actually, to access the fields of a data type, to unbox the data type. And what we do in turn with the primitive integer field of the ihash data constructor here is we do an inner case on it, which corresponds more like to a switch statement, which you might, might know from uh, C or C++. Um, and here we actually have two alternatives, two case of alternatives. And you know, uh, might note that these are basically unordered because, well, the default alternative, which is a fancy way of writing a wildcard by a uh, match, occurs first here, but the default alternative also will only match when all the others, other alternatives didn't match, right? So um, it is quite often that the default alternative, alternative is actually the first alternative. Um, right, so in this example, we've actually all three different kinds of um, alternative or altcon available, right? So a case carries with it a list of case alternatives. Each of these alts looks like this. And the 
distinguishing feature of those is the alt con. And um, there are three kinds of alt cons. A data alt would be this one here, this match on i hash. A lit alt would be formed like this here on a zero hash constructor. So this is a primitive integer literal, right? So just um, if you're wondering what the hash means, yeah. And also we've got a default constructor um, of which there's only one alt con. Um, right, and last but not least, I didn't want to omit how you would construct such a literal, right? So this is basically um, with the lit constructor, you would inject a literal into your syntax tree. Right, so now we've, that we've at least understood or get, got to know the pretty printed version of the core syntax here, let's talk a bit about how this executes, right? But because when we want to talk about core optimizations, it is pretty important that we know where we can optimize a core expression. And um, so one of the first things to realize, which I already said kind of, is that case forces stuff. Case kind of drives the evaluation. And in this case, case evaluates and unboxes the scrutiny, um, which might actually allocate when whatever is bound to n allocates, right? So just um, this will actually perform computation under the hood. Now we have a type class method call here. And what this does at runtime is basically it will fetch the implementation of plus from the dictionary and then do an indirect call to it. So this, so type class method calls are quite costly. They are like a virtual call in an object-oriented language, for example. Um, right, so allocations is the next big topic. Um, in general, or often you can say an, a program that allocates more runs slower than, an, than a program that allocates less. So it's a good idea to try to eliminate all allocations from your program, if you can. Um, in this case, this program allocates data constructor uh, data constructor applications, right? For example, for the argument to minus here or in the um, boxed result. And what's not so obvious here is that even minus and plus will need to allocate because the definition will return a boxed result. And also, you will need to allocate a thunk, right? So Haskell, as much as core, uses the call by neat evaluation strategy, which necessita necessitates that we allocate thunks for arguments, such as the minus <laughs> argument and the sum of argument here, which in turn need their own closure, right? So we, we need to um, allocate in the heap a closure so that at runtime, when we actually need to, alloc uh, need to evaluate the argument, that we know how to compute it, right? So there is quite a lot of overhead introduced by call by need. Fortunately, often we get to optimize it all away, such as in this example. So um, what I did here basically is I passed minus O, obviously, to activate the optimizations of GHC. And I also passed minus ddump simple to get the simplified core output. And then we, were, then we arrive at this form here. Um, the first thing that's notable is that we made two functions out of one, right? So this is uh, called the Walker wrapper split, which GHC performs after having done strictness analysis. Um, basically, what GHC found out is that, well, we can factor sum of in a form where we do all the, the unboxing and reboxing of the iHash constructor inside a small wrapper function called um, sum of, so that the kernel, the recursive kernel, the the worker function is fr completely free of any iHash constructor allocation. And as you can see, we inlined minus and plus, so uh, all the allocation that those guys did could completely, ca completely cancel away. Yeah, this is, this is pretty neat. Uh, by the way, if you've got questions, um, don't hesitate to ask them immediately, right? Are there any questions so far? Oh yes, there's a question. Uh, so this worker wrapper transformation 
gets rid of uh, the overhead of unboxing. I presume there's going to be a little bit of extra overhead from making the extra function call to W sum of. So uh, is, is there a heuristic used to determine uh, when it's worth it to have this extra overhead? Ah, so I guess part of the question is also why do we even need the sum of function, right? So, um, I mean, this, is, this guy is so small, GHC will try to inline it at every call site. But still, we need this function. Can anyone guess why we need it? Yes, there is an answer. Just, I, I will repeat it. I assume it's because you might link with the module and you might access from another module. Yes, that is correct. The answer is we might link from a module. Basically, the idea is we have to announce somewhere the API of this function if we export it from a module. So, um, and the only way of talking about sum of is in terms of its type, for example. So we have to export this type compatibility shim, so to speak, um, over our actual, actual worker function. So um, Ryan's question in turn was, didn't we actually make our program a bit slower in case we don't actually make many calls here? The answer, so for example, for a sum of, of zero, yeah, we, we didn't actually have much of a difference here, right? So we would call sum of, we will unbox the argument and rebox a zero. In this case, we would unbox the argument, call the worker, return from the worker, and then unbox the argument. So there is an additional intervening call. There's another question. What exactly triggers the worker wrapper transformation? Is there anything wired in about iHash, or is it merely the kind of the type uh -huh. of the parameters of iHash? I'd rather postpone this, this question to later when we revisit the worker wrapper transformation. Could you then repost it, or could you remember to, someone remember to re-ask this question, <laughs> please? Thank you, in case I forget it. Uh, to conclude Ryan's question, Yes, there is an additional overhead in, in this call, but it's negligible compared to the opportunities that it unlocks. Don't we also often inline the wrapper? Exactly, but the, the question is basically if we can't inline the wrapper, then there is an overhead actually, yeah. But it's small. I think we have two more questions. Oh, yeah. So, Is $f numint the dictionary for the type class? Exactly. It's but, the type class instance. Sorry, it's, it's yeah. not the type class, it's the type class instance oh, right. for int. Mm. Right, so, the type class instance for int. But uh, normally you said that the first argument to a polymorphic function would be the type. So is... Oh, right. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I, so I is see dollar what... f num int a type? Oh, <laughs> okay. Uh. So this is where, what we initially started out with. Then I introduced what happens if I leave off the minus d suppress all, and then we have the add int there. So does uh, that answer, answer the question? Yes. Yeah, sorry, so Except I... What, what is... I wanted to make the program what smaller. What is all? Because we didn't suppress yes. all of the code. So right? minus d suppress <laughs> all suppresses types, for example. Okay. It also suppresses ID info and other stuff I don't remember, which is documented in the user's guide. And why does... Why is f represented dictionary? Why isn't it dollar $d? Oh, that's, uh, I think it's for defun, no, it's not for defun. It's for, I, I don't know what the, the naming convention eludes me. Maybe Simon knows why it's dollar $f and not dollar $d or something. It's a, it's a dictionary function. Ah, of course, yeah. Ah. In this case, yeah. it takes no dictionaries to a dictionary. Yes, so, so the, the, answer the, the answer is it's a dictionary function, <laughs> right? So, obviously, oh, thank you. it's dollar $f. <laughs> so, I see different instances of case here. Um, so previously on the left side we see a case that has two alternatives. Uh -huh. Then there is somewhere a case that actually unboxes uh, an int somewhere. But on the right hand side I see, yeah exactly, and on the right hand side I see, if I'm not wrong, two cases that don't seem to do anything. Like, uh, th no, the second one. The second, oh, this, yeah, this that guy. one for example. Uh, yeah, okay, so that's, that's a bit tricky. Um, the answer is there is an invariant that you can't let bind complex unboxed stuff like this. You have to use case to make it explicit. So I guess uh, 
at, which also means you can't put it in the argument here. So I, so in Haskell, I would have written I hash of the this application, application here, exactly, right? Yeah. yeah, but you can't do it in core because we will actually get back to it ho hopefully very much later on at the end of the talk. So the, the answer is that GHC assumes that it can float anything freely, which is an, occurs in an argument to a data constructor or to a function. And well, if it's unboxed, it means you float around evaluation of stuff which potentially diverges. So yeah. So there is an invariant that if you can't prove that it terminates, you have to case bind it in this example. Right. Thanks. I'm not really familiar much with core, but like, why does it deal with integers this way, like wraps them in the first place? You mean why we desugar Haskell integers to something that is boxed in the first place? Yeah. Right. So imagine that you have a thunk, like uh, sum of a thousand. Uh, you write, oh, let me see, um, you write a list, a list where every element is sum of a thousand or sum of a sum of n, where n is determined by the length of the list, doesn't matter. So the, the point is that you put a thunk into the list, right? So something that is suspended and that you only want to compute when it, when it is actually forced. So the, way you, the only way you can hide thunks is by a pointer in direction, right? So everything, even integers, must hide behind a pointer in direction if you want to put them in a thunk. Does that about answer the question? So if you have primitive integers, they aren't pointers, and you can't hide thunks behind them. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. Thanks. Right, OK. Then I'll continue uh, with our journey here. These are good questions. Keep shooting them. <laughs> um, right, oh, so now that we've optimized, we've got to run it, right? So this is the unoptimized program, you remember. This is the optimized one perhaps even with O2, I don't recall actually. So what happened is the allocations went down by 85%, which is huge, right? Um, and also the runtime, if you look at the runtime, you notice a speed of, of over 200%. So yay GHC. But I mean, hmm, it still allocates. Where does it allocate? So this is, this is something where the people who, who watched Simon's talk from last year should wake up and answer the question. <laughs> is there an answer? Perhaps there is. Is it the call stack, the continuation stack of ah, cases? So yeah, the call stack, exactly. So this, this function here, it isn't tail recursive. So Imagine you're a compiler and you have to compile this call site. What are you doing? So basically you can jump to this function, but at some point you've got to return. Where do you return to? And also, um, right, you've, you've got to return to something that references m, which is bound here, and also the result. So what happens is that a continuation is pushed onto GHC's continuation stack, right? And this stack doesn't live actually in the C stack, it actually lives in the Haskell heap, in the managed heap. So what happens is that for every recursion, and I think this is for, for an input of like 400 million or something, um, we push onto the stack another um, update frame, uh, sorry, return frame. Yeah, and that's, that makes it slow. If you actually do the work and factor the original sum of function into a form where it's ta tail recursive, which you can do by introducing an accumulator, SIGP style, then you will notice that this, this optimized program will operate in constant space, like 51 kilobytes, and take 0 0.003, so three milliseconds, which is, yeah, much, much, much faster. Okay. Cool, someone paid attention. Wonderful. <laughs> Great. So, um, next slide. Um, I haven't talked about polymorphism and let bindings yet. Um, so, here is the typical fixed function from the pr prelude. There is abundant uh, polymorphism here. So, um, this is the desugaring to core. And the first thing that you'll notice is that we've got type lambdas, right? So, previously we've, we've reviewed 
a value lambda where the lambda had a, an ID binder. Now this is a type variable. Um, this is all to, due to system F again. And also note that this type variable may occur in the types to the right here. So, um, and relatedly, at the type level, a type lambda is accompanied by a for all binder, right? So this is advanced type system stuff. Well, not so much, but um, in core, this is all explicit, right? And the other thing is, well, this encoding of a recursive lab binding isn't particularly surprising, apart from that we have explicit lab uh, recursive bindings, right? And what is interesting is its right-hand side. The right-hand side here is not a value. It's, it's not a lambda, and it's also not a data constructor application. So this is a thunk. And these thunks are memoized in our language, in our call by need language, so that after it has been evaluated, it will, its runtime object will be overwritten with the value it evaluated to. Um, one more example for casts on end creations, uh, which I haven't yet covered. So creations basically encode equality proofs between two types. And whenever you write a new type, for instance, you introduce such a creation into the program, which is used by the compiler. So the new type constructor A introduces a creation from H to int in this example. And then when you actually unpack such a new type constructor, what the, the sugaring to, to core contains is a cast expression, which casts along this creation. So uh, the A guy here has type A, and the creation goes from H to int, so the total expression here has type int. Um, these casts, they are zero cost, which means they are actually erased after we leave core, so they are a, a pure type system theoretical construct. Yeah, and nevertheless, it's important that we care about keeping them small because they affect code load in the simplifier. And well, yeah, we've got to make sure that we keep them as local as possible. Right, the only constructor I won't be talking much about is the tick constructor, which, as we've already heard, wraps around debugging information. Um, yeah, if that comes up during your core journeys, I suggest you check out the headocs because that's what I do every time I need to look up what tick means. There is a question. What are the other things that might result in a coercion being introduced or a cast? Right, so, exactly. So, thank you. Uh, forgot about to talk about this. So, I. I said new types and, well, matches on new types introduce creations, but also type families. Type families, um, whenever you let a type family reduce, the proof of that reduction is carried along in a creation. Right? And, um, yeah, if you have some, some, some type family f, f of bool equals int, then, and you want to use something of type f bool as an int, then what happens is that you have this a guy of type f bool and cast it along this creation that says, well, f of bool is int, and then the whole expression becomes has type int. Get it, get it too. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, of co of course. Yeah, get it actually contain these. Uh, no, it's not about the fields that. It, oh, yes, get it contains as a constructor. So the the sugaring of GDTs is such that they. The, the data constructor contains a proof that the result type of that data constructor is of a particular form. And a quick question, a follow mm -hmm. up on the type families. And if there is a recursive type family that sort of calls itself, do mm -hmm. you then record the whole trace of the uh, reduction or is it sort of just one? Exactly, that's a good question. Uh, he got a oh, mic. Yeah, Sorry. So that's, Sorry. that's a great question if the type formula is recursive and uh, the type checker figured out that it reduces to some type, then we still get one creation that says, well, this reduced to this type. So there is no computation going on in core anymore. Or no yeah. nope. trying to reenact the computation. So uh, when these coercions are introduced, then I think ddump ds or ddump simple are not actually printing them. 
um, and I, I sometimes find that unhelpful. Am I just doing something uh -huh. wrong? Or, I mean, they're used if mm -hmm. they're used, but if they're introduced by something, I can't see them in the output, I think. That is strange. Did you pass minus D suppress something? Um, oh, is it? Okay, could be. Yeah, so I oh, think so minus, D suppress, suppress, okay. minus D suppress all will, oh. I think, also suppress casts. Uh, I remember Simon's talk's title was mentioning core being nine constructors, but <laughs> I'm counting 10 here. So is there a new one introduced in the Yeah, I mean, mind? tick is the, how do you say, the ugly duckling or something? <laughs> uh, I see, thank you. I guess. So this is something I wondered this morning too, but yeah. <laughs> So tick doesn't actually carry any semantic meaning as far as the program semantics is concerned. It's only there for uh, debugging, for um, profiling, for coverage. Else. Sorry? Coverage. Coverage checking, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So no, not coverage checking, but coverage. Code, code coverage. coverage exactly. reporting. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so off to the next section. Uh, GHC's core optimizations. Right, so. Um, We've now left the Deshugura and we've introduced a bunch of core syntax and we can probably read some pretty printed core. Let's leave it at that because now we are going to talk about optimizations in terms of um, Haskell again because it's much, more, it's, it's much more to the point to talk about Haskell and dive into the, the core of excerpts as, as needed. So this is the whole compiler pipeline with minus 01. You can read this off by going into this module here GHC core op pipeline and read the get core to do function. So the first pass that happens is type class specialization. Consider this, this program here where we have the foo function. Now you might remember that this here is like a virtual call, right? So um, what happens at runtime is we fetch from the dictionary denum in this case, which is passed in as an argument, right? So this is when it's dollar denum, when, when it's bound as an argument. Um, we fetch from the argument the implementation of plus and call it with, well, something here is an integer literal which will de sugar to from integer something. Now, this is all pretty wasteful given that main will always call foo with an int, right? So this is, the, this is the call site here in main and what this type class special laser does is it looks for these call sites to a polymorphic function such as foo and it will then, given, yeah, so in this example, it will take foo and partially, special, uh, partially evaluate the body of foo for this dictionary. And this yields this specialization function as foo here, in which, after a pass of the simplifier, which will do inlining, will, well, simply expose the primitive integer operation, right? So this is a great speed up in fact. And well, how does the specializer do this? Well, it allocates a rewrite rule of this form here. So I guess part of the question here is why don't, don't we run these passes multiple times? Yeah. So how often do you want to run them? Do you I'm want seeing to run a lot of these passes are running multiple point? times, right? But not specialization. For you want to run uh, type class specialization multiple times? I guess. Yeah, you could. I mean, of, of course, at some point you might see more opportunities for specialization. And actually, part of the engineering work here in, in GHC is to figure out a good position to have an optimization pass or to have run an optimization pass. But of course, given our time constraints, I mean, resource constraints within GHC, um, you always have to think twice before introducing a new pass, if that makes sense. And it's often good to, th maybe often it is even possible to carry it out all in the same pass if you think hard enough about the problem. Uh, so this sequence of passes here is a bit, you know, seat of the pants. I mean, there's no real proper scientific, I mean, maybe maybe we're going to cover this, sort of an investigation into which order and how often they should be repeated. And, you know, maybe we should, you know, do, do several one after the other. So there was some, um, now I'm suddenly blanking on her name, there was a PhD student at Edinburgh who wrote a fairly recent paper 
who did a fairly systematic study about trying to reorder transformations. And I do think there's some low-hanging fruit here. I think we could probably get, you know, an extra 10% of juice without increasing compilation time if you could just use as much energy as Switzerland consumes in a week to do lots of different, you know, trials uh, to see which order the uh, transformation should go in. So I think there's, some, there's a useful job of work to be done there. It's all very seat of the pants at the moment. Let's make it better. Celeste. Celeste, that's right. Yeah. Celeste Hollander. That's right. That's it. So, this is float out. Actually, float out runs twice, as, as you see, and this is pro probably what, what caused the question. Um, yeah, so also, as I mentioned, this first pass of float out is a little bit different than the latter one because it will only float out stuff that has no free variable, variable whatsoever. So, um, basically, this means always to the top level, but not quite because that apparently does mean something else because there are two separate conflict. Uh, configuration flags for float out. Whatever. So, um, coming up now is the simplifier. So, um, when I talk about the simplifier, I mean a bunch of cascading local optimizations plus inlining. And what I don't mean is the entirety of all core optimizations, which I would refer to as core simplification or something like that, right? So, um, the simplifier does so many things it's worth having a short digression. So, um, the, the most important one, at least to me, is that it removes CRUD. So, it, it performs a bunch of local optimizations, such as case of case, case of non-constructor, and beta reduction, which, well, just tidies up the program. The second most important optimization is let inlining, because otherwise, the first one won't have to chew, won't have anything to chew on, right? So. It does also do let inlining. It also does apply rewrite rules, such as for the specializer that we heard earlier. And um, actually, the rewrite rule framework is pretty important because we've, we've got list fusion, which builds on the three distinct phases that the simplifier runs in, right? So this main pass of the simplifier here, it actually runs thrice. And by running, I actually mean there are multiple iterations in that the simplifier goes over the program until it can't improve it anymore, and then the next run of the simplifier happens, right? And, well, we've got three runs here to order the, uh, rewrite, the activation of the rewrite rules necessary for list fusion. Then we, the simplifier also does constant folding, which p neatly piggybacks on the rewrite rule framework. It does EDA expansion and reduction, which unfortunately I won't be talking about today due to time constraints. And well, it also does a bunch of other stuff that you can read about in the compilation by transformation thesis by Andre Santos, which is pretty interesting. And also, well, it does some more newish things on cast optimizations. Are there some kind of guarantees of termination of this simplification pro simplifying process? Ah, are there termination guarantees? So, as I said, each run of the simplifier does multiple iterations, right? And I said it iterates until it doesn't have anything to chew on anymore. But it can, in fact, happen, and it does happen, that the simplifier has more to chew on even after four iterations, I think is the current bound. And then it will output a warning, basically. Mm -hmm and say, well, I've got to give up at some point. And if you want more iterations, you can pass this flag to increase the number of iterations and pay for, for yourself in what compile like time. Cyclic inlining. Sorry? Like cyclic inlining. Cyclic like inlining is another, uh, this is another great question. So you also probably want to know when I'm doing inlining of a recursive function, for example, right? This could be very harmful and indeed GHC does not do inlining of a recursive function unless there are multiple recursive functions and it can pick out certain loop breakers so that every possible loop is broken while doing inlining. Um, we'll, I'll add to that in a second. So, local optimizations. One particularly simple one is case of non constructor. Um, if you've got a program like this here, um, which uses often don't write, don't often write, but can arise after some other transformations such as the specializer has run. Um, then GHC performs an optimization called case of non-constructor in which 
it replaces basically, well, the case eats the data constructor, and which amounts to inlining uh, the, the tuple into, well, the, the alternative here, binding x to true and y to false. And we get this expression. And then the cascade continues, and we do inlining a bunch of beta reduction, which means that we introduce, oh, so uh, inlining means we've, we, we will basically just replace this guy um, by a lambda expression and then do beta reduction on these two arguments it is supplied, which in turn does not simply substitute the arguments into the, the body of, of the definition of the conjunction operator, but it will let bind them before doing so, so that we can, we can again um, apply the same heuristics to these guys instead of having to, well, always duplicate the arguments or having to invent independent duplication detection. Right, and then after a po a performing a bunch of um, more let inlining and then one more case of non-constructor, we arrive simply at faults here. So inlining, this is the next key enabling transformation. Sorry, it's the next key transformation I want to talk about be because it enables so many other optimizations, right? So inlining in itself doesn't do anything good, right? I mean, you get rid of the call overhead, but the call overhead is most of the time negligible. What isn't neglig negligible is the opportunities to optimize a function body with respect towards call side, right? So suddenly when we inline, we can do all kinds of stuff like case of non-constructor as we've seen and all the other cascading optimizations and then do, um, we, we, we get to do better loop analysis and, and so on. So um, <clears throat> if anything, inlining is an important enabling transformation. Right, inlining works by simply taking the right-hand side of a let-bound variable and inline it at the occurrence of a let-bound variable. Um, in this case, we've just inlined one occurrence, but in practice, you could also inline at all occurrences in which the binding is dead and you can drop it. Now, <clears throat> there is a technical challenge involved with inlining and substitution in general, namely name capture. So consider this example here. Um, if we were to inline X, we've got to, well, rename the inner Y binding because this free variable does not refer to the same name or to the same binding as, or it does not refer, to, it cannot refer to this binding. So. Um, what we do in practice is we keep track of all the in-scope variables of an expression, and then when we encounter, when we go under a binding that binds a variable that is already part of the in-scope set, we rename this variable accordingly to a name that is not part of the in-scope set. And, well, this is a surprisingly tricky technique, but it is also necessary to adopt this such a name full representation because it's fast, as you can read in this paper here. This paper, Secrets of the GHC Inliner, also has a bunch of more details on, on inlining. There's a question. Yeah, so my question is about uh, sharing and how does, does that affect sharing? Um, because it looks to me that it does. And, uh... Yes, it does. Maybe let me continue with the talk. I think it will become clear or you can restate your question there. Um, so, technical challenges aside, there is also an engineering challenge here to solve. Namely, when should we inline? So there are a lot of heuristics and they are all described in this paper I just said. Um, so, for example, is it okay to duplicate the code of the right-hand side, right? So it might really fast lead to code explosion if we get this wrong. So, in order to answer this, it's pretty easy to answer a follow, uh, to pose a follow-up question, namely, how often does x occur, right, the let bound variable x, how often does it occur? And this question is answered for a separate analysis, which is called occurrence analysis, which runs before each iteration of the simplifier. Um, occurrence analysis also does dependency analysis, which means it untangles let recs using strongly component, strongly connected component analysis. And it also identifies join points, 
The other question is, when x uh, occurs multiple times, we might still want to inline it if it is reasonably small, right? And reasonably small might also depend on how viable it is to inline it. Um, and this is basically calculated or estimated by uh, the function calculated unfolding guidance, which I suggest you check out if you want to improve the inlining heuristics. So the other engineering challenge with uh, inlining is, of course, when the right-hand side is not a value but a thunk, such as sum of a thousand here. Now, if we have multiple occurrences of x on the same path, on the same trace, right? So if we evaluate x multiple times, then the second one or the, the subsequent one after the first one will simply reuse the value of sum of a thousand. Not so if we inline the right-hand side. We suddenly duplicated work, is what we call it. And depending on how much work that is, it might be viable to actually duplicate the work. And this is, for example, governed by experts HNF in GHC core utils, which determines whether something is a value. Can the unfolding also contain itself optimized code? Can the unfolding contain like, itself? It, yes. It's like the right-hand side, but optimized locally. So can the unfolding contain its own right-hand side, but in an optimized form? Right. So like, if you just look at the right-hand side in isolation, uh -huh. you could maybe still do some optimizations. OK. So I guess maybe I'll phrase it differently. So there are things such as stable inlinings. If the user writes inline on one of their functions, then it might indeed be the case that, that GHC optimizes the right-hand side of the original binding, making it larger, inlining stuff, simplifying it. But crucially, the unfolding still contains the original right-hand side that the user wrote. Is that in yeah. line yeah. with what you asked? Okay. Cool. By inline, you mean the pragma inline? Yeah, the inline pragma, of course, yeah. So the reason is that if the user writes inline, we interpret it as, well, please inline this, this exact right-hand side. So we have to keep on to it, which carries with it a cost, actually, because you have to maintain more code. Okay. Uh, Another question. Do we also do constant evaluation of, um, yeah, sum of a thousand is, uh, yeah, fully qualified. So we could constantly evaluate it on compile time. Yeah, so I think this is basically um, partial evaluation. Um, no, we don't. Not, not really. I mean, um, sum of is a recursive function, and we will stop as soon as there is a recursive call in between, because we won't try to reason symbolically ab about the recursive function, for example. Does that answer but the question? Follow-up question? Yeah, so we don't do, um, yeah, we don't check if the arguments, yeah, um, go smaller to continue constant no, evaluation. There is no kind of termination checking or whether it's feasible to um, evaluate it at compile time. I mean, that might change when dependent types become more familiar. I mean, we could probably do some kind of uh, bytecode interpretation even now, but I, I won't, I can't fathom it <laughs> at the moment, sorry. Yeah, but it's a good idea in principle, and I agree. So, I mean, someone has to implement it and make it so that it doesn't block down GHC's compile pipeline. There's another question here, I guess. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the GHC documentation says that the inline pragma says, please inline this, and inlineable pragma says, you may consider inlining this, but it, the inliner will consider inlining something whether or not you say inlineable. So what, what's the use of adding the inlineable pragma? What does that actually do? Uh, that, that's that's a great question. Yeah. What use, and how do I know when I should use the inline pragma if I don't really know whether it's going to take my suggestion? <laughs> OK, so inlineable is most importantly there so that you can tell GHC, do, in, at any rate, do provide or take this unfolding with you and export it so that it's available in, uh, across modules, for example. Whereas the unfoldings that GHC calculates on the, on the fly won't be exported if they become too huge. That's one big difference. Also, inlineable carries with it the same implication, namely that you want to expose in the unfolding the original 
right-hand side, not the optimized one. Um, whereas if you don't do any annotations, what can happen but must not or, or needn't happen is or must not necessarily happen is that you can um, you can get into the, into the situation that GHC drops the optimized unfolding because it's too huge. Because it simply says, well, I don't want to store like 10,000 a 10,000 term function in the in, in the interface file because it's so huge it won't inline anyway. Um, yeah. So with inlineable, you make sure that the, the unfolding is there at at all costs, basically. And also, you make sure that the original right hand side is there. You can control that the inlining uh, the unfolding is there with a compile time flag, which is f expose all, all unfoldings. X, f ex minus f expose all unfoldings. But yeah, I mean, then you are then you are committing to code blow up, which uh, in the interface file, which I guess is your choice. Mm -hmm. um, there is another local optimization I want to talk about quickly, which is um, case of case. Imagine that you wrote this not null function, and uh, by using by reusing your cool not and null functions, GHC will happily inline this and do some beta reduction and then inlining the resulting let bindings and so on to arrive at this form. Note that there is a case expression, an outer case expression, with where the scrutiny itself is a case expression. Now, what GHC does here is basically it says, well, I can push the outer case expression into the branches of the inner case expression in a process named case of case. The result is that, as you can see by the colors, that we've duplicated the outer case into each branch of the inner case, which is fine here. Uh, we can simplify with case of non-constructor and write this code as if we had handwritten not null in an efficient form in the first place. Uh, yes, case of non-constructor. But beware code bloat. If our right-hand side is not just false or true of the outer case here, but it's a big expression one and a big expression two, and we blindly duplicate the whole case expression into each branch of the inner case, we get code blow up. GHC solves this by introducing a special kind of let binding named a join point. So um, for now, as I say, these join points are, if you don't want to reason about performance, you can simply think of them as let bindings. Um, and yeah, in that case, it's pretty easy to understand. The, the big advantage here is that there's only one occurrence of big one and one occurrence of big two, and we still get to simplify um, the case with E1 here and E2 in individually. Right. Um, now, if join bindings are, well, semantically, basically, well, no, no, not, not quite. So if I can emulate join points with let bindings, why should I retain join, join points in the first place? Well, what's interesting about join points is that they can, due to the fact that they never escape and that all their calls must be in tail position, they don't need a closure. Right, so they can reuse the closure of G in this case. And also, these jumps here, these funny call sites, they really mean basically adjust the stack pointer and jump. There is no calling convention overhead and possibly oversaturated stuff happening here. It's pretty efficient. So as a rule of thumb, whenever you see a let binding, you might want to try to turn it into a join point because then you don't allocate. And when you see a join point, you might think, well, can I get more simplification if I inline it, right? Because then the other local optimizations can kick in. There's a whole paper about um, join points and detecting join points named compiling without continuations. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, you can detect whether so there is no separate core form for join points, but you can detect whether or not something is a, is a join point by using the is join bind predicate uh, on the core bind structure. Bind is other. Uh, a rec or a non-rec. Right, so um, uh, there's a question yeah, there. Just a small question. So mm -hmm. couldn't we just, uh, like whenever, so whenever we have a let uh, or something similar, like uh, we just 
transform all of this to join pointers and then decide at the second step which one of these join uh, uh, things we want to inline? Or is it actually what's happening? Uh, okay, so you c it's a structural invariant that join points may not escape and may not be take, uh, must always be take hold. So if you can provide, provided that your let binding is always used in this way, right? Then you can actually turn it into a join point straight away. But the challenge is in identifying it, and this is done by the occurrence analyzer, fully automated. Mm -hmm. So if we're doing local transformations, um, say for example, case of case, um, what if there is like, for example, a cast between the cases? Um, is there some sort of principled approach to commuting these casts out of, uh, away from, no? Um, I say yes, there is, without knowing <laughs> there is one, but I'm pretty sure there is because the simplifier does a bunch of quite, quite many local optimizations that I think floating around cases is one of them. Uh, sorry, casts is one of them. Let's continue. Um, right, so join points. Uh, We've discussed join points. There came up a question whether or not these jump guys, these jump statements here, do carry meaning or what they mean. Um, the answer is these are simply inserted by the pretty printer. So as far as the core code is concerned, this is simply a variable occurrence of J1. Right? The only distinguishing feature is that the occurrence of the variable carries with it the var data structure right, of the variable. And inside the var data structure is stored the information of whether or not this is a jo the corresponding binding is a join point or not. And as always, stuff like this is so these the new variable data structure, if it is if it was changed before, is um, is propagated to use sites by occurrence analysis. If you wonder how they get there. Local optimizations are kind of like the bread and butter skill of every compiler. So it's quite crucial that GHC has its own too. And they are so useful, in fact, that they run after multiple times or at multiple times during the compilation pipeline, right? So right at the beginning is a gentle pass. We run it right here and here and here. As, so this is indicated by the dashed orange lines. Um, so there's kind of a symbiosis here ha happening. So global optimizations can focus on their great goal of achieving more clarity of the program code, while they can, um, they can expect the local optimizations that happen afterwards to clean up after them. Um, I think when I showed David the slides, he, uh, he compared this to the macro writer's bill of rights, uh, which is a, a talk you could look up on YouTube uh, where Basically, macro writers, where they, where they say that macro writers should be expected to, to have access to certain kinds of optimizations that run after them, such as constant folding, um, uh, copy propagation, and so on. So this is basically the same. The global optimizations can assume that they uh, will have some, somebody to clean up after them. So I've listed you three papers here that um, are relevant to the simplifier. As I said, the center's thesis here lists many more of those nifty local optimizations. Another question? Uh, yeah. Can you be more specific? By local optimizations, you mean simplification, like the, the simplifier, right? Yes. And local, so, global, you mean what? Local optimization, by local optimization, I mean these small transformations, these small local things that do case of case, case of non constructor. There is some local let floating happening. Uh, beta reduction, I would consider a local optimization. Um, right, so these kinds. I, I think there are a lot more that I don't recall currently. Um, hence, in this first paper here, which is a PhD thesis, there are, is a much bigger list. There's another I'm question. Sorry, can you explain again what you meant by global? What do I mean by a global optimization is, is the question. Well, global optimization passes are these guys here, basically. So any of these guys may run with the sole purpose of finding some kind of particular uh, code patterns that could be optimized, maybe even beyond function boundaries, such as the specializer, right? The specializer looks at 
call sites of a function and figures out, well, I could, because I call foo at int here, I can provide a specialized version of, 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 of foo. But what the specializer doesn't need to care about is how the rewrite rule is actually applied. Well, that isn't true particularly lately. But um, it, it doesn't care about exploiting the specialization, right? So all it does is it says, well, the dictionary that you pass to the, to the type class method plus, this is the num instance of int. It doesn't do the inlining of um, projecting out the, uh, the particular implementation and then projecting out the application to the primitive addition function, for example. This is all the work of the simplifier. OK, so just to clarify one more time. So you're saying that the simplifier runs at each of those lines, at each of those dotted lines. Exactly. Yeah. The, the dashed lines indicate when the simplifier runs. Yeah. In addition, addition, to, the in one. addition to the main yeah. run of the simplifier, which is, so the main run is the main run because it has a certain purpose, namely to enable uh, the, those three phases to activate inline uh, pragmas and rewrite rules to enable the list fusion framework, for example. At least that's how I interpret it. Yeah. So. Right. So float in. Float in is a pass that simply figures out, well, foo here only uses a on one code path. It doesn't use it whenever n is odd. So it would be odd <laughs> to allocate a whenever, uh, to, to allocate a even on the odd code path. So what it does, it performs a free variable analysis and figures out, well, I can push it into the first case branch here, and we are all good to go. Right, call RT is a pass that, unfortunately, I'm not going to cover today. Uh, there's a whole paper about it, if you're excited about it, um, which you will be after you, re you read the paper. I was. <laughs> then, um, yeah, you, can, you probably know more about it than I do, because it's a, quite a long time since I read the paper. Right, demand analysis, on the other hand, is another big one, and I, one I'm particularly invested in. So the purpose of demand analysis is to try to find out how often and how deep an expression is evaluated. Together with constructed product result analysis, the second guy here, um, demand analysis also determines whether or not a box is used or not. So uh, we can't really see that in this presenta representation. We can but we can see it in this representation. So what demand analysis figures out here is first off that sum of is strict in his argument, right? So strictness is a necessary condition to be able to unbox arguments in the first place. Now, um, what demand analysis also figures out is that the box, the iHash thing here, is never used inside the body, right? So there's no S pattern here. That's the way you would see it in, in source Haskell. Um, so, yeah, the, the box is discarded. Um, furthermore, there is quite some redundant boxing going on here. So uh, that's the, the job of constructed product result analysis to figure out, well, sum of will re -bo or box up the result on, at each exit point, right? So all the boxing up could be moved to the, to the callee, in fact. And now that demand analysis and CPR analysis have figured this out. The next pass is the worker wrapper transformation. And the, what the worker wrapper transformation is, uh, does is basically it tries to move all the blue parts, which denotes kind of, so um, if you look at sum of, you will notice that it allocates stuff on the exit or when it calls itself recursively, and it will unbox stuff when it is entered very roughly speaking, right? So if we were able to move the, the boxing up from the exit to the begin of the function, the boxing and the unboxing would simply cancel away. And that's the, uh, the idea of worker, the worker wrapper transformation. Um, basically, the, the code fragments here in purple and the code fragments here in blue, um, they correspond roughly to a function structure such as this one. And when we simply apply the uh, fix po the, the rolling rule of fix points once, we get to push this guy out, but also duplicate it at the end. And now these two functions, they cancel out. There's another question. Yeah. Uh, so, A, you, you said that it'd be a bad idea to unbox something with many fields. Why is that? 
Okay, because when, so, assuming that all the fields are used of the data structure, you end up with a workup. So, what would happen if you unbox a field with very many fields? So, so a record with ma very many fields. Well, you end up with a worker function that takes all those fields as a parameter. Now, if you've, uh, you've got a record with 200, 280 fields, you end up with a function with 280 parameters, but you only got 16 registers. So what inevitably will happen is that some of those arguments will, for the function call, be spilled onto the stack. And I don't mean the C stack, I mean the Haskell stack, the same stack that is responsible for doing the return handling, uh, or the, the continuation handling. Whereas if you didn't work a wrapper, you'd have to pass one thing. I exactly. So, the, yeah. So. The, so the other question I had. So CPR and worker wrapper seem kind of duels to one another in some sense, right? I mean, one is acting yeah. on the arguments, one's acting on the results, and they're both mm -hmm. unboxing in some way. So is there something to be had? I mean, is that, is that yeah, a valid so observation? That's some, so actually, there's, there, I've got some stuff in my mind that I've not come to oh, okay. uh, act on yet. But so basically, demand analysis performs two things. One is the, well, how often and how deep stuff. It counts stuff. The other is, is the box needed or not? This is boxity analysis. Now, constructed product result is kind of like the dual to boxity analysis because, well, uh, constructed product result analysis tries to figure out for the results whether the box is needed, right? So in this case, it's always freshly allocated, so you could push the allocation to the caller. And um, for the arguments, you would uh, need the boxity an analysis and, well, say, well, if you, if you use the argument somewhere, you can't, you don't actually save allocation because you need to box it up anyway, right? So this is kind of, they are very similar in a way. And I think they should be merged at some point, but not yet. For completeness sake, I, I guess you, you've already seen this function only in core. Now this is the definition in, in Haskell. Basically, you could write this into your editor and compile it given the language extension magic hash and import dhc.ext. Yes. Right, so there's also a paper about worker wrapper. In fact, there are multiple papers about worker wrapper because it's a very nice mechanism, right? It's driven by types and you can have nice uh, fixed, point, fixed point properties uh, about them and prove them. So there are quite a few papers. Um, right, exitification is the next pass up. We will also not talk about this, this pass, unfortunately. Um, it's a small pass, very small pass anyway, and with a very specific purpose. So then we've uh, a second pass, pass of float out. Now we will actually also float to intermediate le levels based on how many free variables there are and where these free variables are bound. But in this example here, we again float to the top level only that there are now two occurrences of the same expression that we flow to the top level. And this is on purpose because the next pass here is CSE, common sub-expression elimination. And common sub-expression elimination will note that these two expressions are equivalent and, well, will simply make the second one point to the, fir to the first one and also make it so that the second one is actually completely dead and will be dropped by the next run of the occurrence analyzer, who, by the way, or which, by the way, can also figure out that stuff is never actually, never actually occurs, right? So it can, can occur, uh, count that it occurs once, it can, occur, uh, it can also count that it occurs never, so. Right, so second pass of float in is same as before. Um, no new, I mean, if you float out, you probably also want to float in afterwards if there are new um, op opportunities after float out. And we finish up the minus 01 pipeline with a, another run of demand analysis. And this guy, th this run here isn't concerned at all with boxity and worker wrapper. It's only there to, to count things. In this case, we are interested in finding, in this example, arguments that are evaluated at most once. Why is that? Well, if you've got a call site, so um, not also that this B here or this, this F function is also not strict in B, so we can't unbox it. But we can still infer that B is evaluated at most once. Now at the call site of F, there is no need to memoize the argument value because we know it is only ever evaluated at most once. 
So we don't need to push an update frame at runtime is what the operational reading of that is. Right, so this is the complete minus 01 pipeline. With minus 02, there are just two passes more. Um, case liberation is pretty simple. You've got a recursive function, and with a case on a free variable, what case liberation does is unroll the loop once, or, yeah, well, basically copy the let binding to its occurrence site here, and then simplify, right? So uh, simplify so that the simplifier can detect that the inner case here is fully redundant and simply drop it because it knows that V is of the form AB and, well, it can just reuse the outer case. This is just an optimization to make the inner loop faster. Right, constructor specialization is another specialization pass. This one isn't about type classes and dictionaries. We are not specializing on dictionaries. We are specializing on data structures. That's the gist of it. The challenge here is code blow up too. And um, constructor specialization has, has some very targeted measures to prevent that. Da, da, da. Yeah, th then there's the second pass of CSE and we're done. So um, for reference, this is a list, an exhaustive list of all the optimizations that run during our core pipeline um, with all their names attached to it. Um, all these operations, uh, optimizations live in ghc.core.opt. Right, so after core optimizations, we go on to lower the core in preparation to move to STG. The first pass here of note is core tidy, which, well, as the name suggests, tidies up the core, uh, leaves off, throws away some information in the ID infrastructure and marks top level bindings as global, some housekeeping stuff in order to serialize the core module into interface files, right? So in interface files are the key to enable cross-module optimizations. So um, the way you would peek into an interface file is using the minus minus show minus i face uh, flag of GHC, and then you've got to point it to an hi file, which is the abbreviation for Haskell interface, I guess. And I said this earlier, so this is an example output of, of this invocation, and you see that the unfolding here is also um, present in the, in the interface file, as well as, for example, strictness signatures, arity info, yeah, stuff that I've not talked about. All right. <clears throat> um, after core tidy, we still have two passes left, and those two are there with the sole aim to go to STG. Um, what that means is basically um, we bring the core in the past core prep into a form that is very easy to translate into STG. So core prep is still a core to core pass. And what it does is basically it, well, brings the core into a normal form, for short ANF, which means that non-trivial argument, arguments, so everything that is not a literal or a variable, so those are the both trivial um, uh, kinds of expressions. Non-trivial arguments must be let bound. So, um, and also anonymous lambdas must be let bound. So, for example, we can understand it also in Haskell. Um, we have this map expression. Uh, this lambda here is going to be let bound, as well as this nested list actually turns into two let bindings, right? Because uh, the tail here is also not an ANF. So, why are, am I telling telling you this? Well. Generally, let bindings in core, or let bindings in general, denote allocation, right? But before core prep, we don't actually see all the allocations as let, as let bindings, right? So as I just said, some arguments turn into let bindings. Some of them might even turn into case bindings when they're cheap to evaluate, or they will terminate quickly, and so on. So it's not at all trivial to always spot which of those arguments turn into let bindings and which aren't. So after core prep, I give you a guarantee, well, short, sort of, that 99.9% .9 of all allocation sites are visible as let bindings. Exceptions down below, not important. Um, you can dump the uh, core prepped output by passing minus dedump prep. And uh, I've also brought you the uh, CMM, C minus minus output here to the right with minus minus the dump CMM. So we skipped STG basically. The reason is that we can see allocation like this here. So 
in C minus minus we can directly see the bumping of the of the heat pointer, right? We have a bump allocator, which is, makes this very convenient. We see that we allocate 64 bytes, 64 bytes just for the closures of these guys here. Two for, for the lambda here, one code pointer, one free variable, and then three each for the data structure here. And now just to repeat what I've now said a couple of times about case, case drives evaluation. So um, if you case on an argument, for example, what happens is that we actually perform an indirect call, right? So um, this is what happens here. R1 stores basically the, um, the pointer, the code pointer to the first argument. Um, so we do an indirect call here, an unknown call. This is pretty costly just to yeah, get, get the implications into your head, what this costs. <laughs> and then we've got an if um, statement basically saying, well, if it's 42, jump to this guy, otherwise do the other stuff. And of course, this case binding happens before anything in this case alternative, which would force this let binding, which performs another case. Right, and I think this is now enough context for you to really drill down on the operational implications of, of core and to um, know what goes fast or could go faster at least. Right, so uh, off now to actually trying to fix a bug. I say trying because, well, I tried. <laughs> More on that later, maybe not, we'll see. So um, common sub-expression elimination is the path that I mostly glanced over, but it's small and contained. And yeah, compared to work on the front end, these optimization passes, this what I call global optimization passes, they are mostly small and contained, which makes them rather, rather easy to contribute to and get an overview over. So um, we will be fixing this ticket here, but before I introduce you to that ticket, let's have a short introduction to how exactly CSE works. So imagine we've, the, we've got these four bindings here. Um, CSE maintains a so-called reverse mapping right, from basically right-hand sides of a definition to the binder that defines them. And if you, go, if you go over these two bindings here, you would, for example, accumulate this reverse mapping here. So nothing interesting has yet happened because there is no redundancy yet, but you can already see that A and C are equivalent, and so are B and D. So A and C, that's easy to see, right? Um, you can take the so when we try to look up in the reverse mapping the right-hand side of the C binding, we immediately, immediately get a match, namely to A. And when we go over D, well, there is no match, right? So our map here does not have a match for two cons C. Um, because the map does not know about the local equality of, um, that is induced by the right-hand side of C. So what CSE does instead, for such trivial bindings, right? So trivial, remember, it means literal or um, variable. It in instead accumulates a mapping, a substitution from var to var, so a renaming substitution, from C to A in this case, right? So we add, add the information that C, every occurrence of C is mapped to be mapped to A. You can think of this second map here kind of like as a union find to find the unique representative of the equivalence class of C in this example. Right, so what we do is we apply the substitution to D's right hand side, get two cons A here, and then we get a match, boom, B. Nice. So that's it. Um, oh, of course, one thing here is important. We would only get the match if we applied the reverse map, uh, the renaming substitution on the right-hand side before we do the lookup in the reverse mapping, right? That's pretty important. <clears throat> There's a question? Yeah, uh, shadowing. So shadowing, you, ah. Yeah. Is that allowed in core? And, and how, I mean, because it wouldn't be safe to, you know, just yes. rely yes, on. Yes, yes, yes. It's always shadowing, right? So shadowing is not only a problem when we do inlining, it's also a problem when we do these kinds of passes. So when we move some kind of, um, um, so, it, Every time we move under a binder, we have to do something to make sure that we rename in a way that shadowing does not occur. And the way we usually do it is by piggybacking on the substitution structure. 
Um, I'll come back to that in a second because that's exactly where I want to go. I had a question about the um, demand analysis. And you made a remark there about the, uh, the, the absence of an as pattern. Yeah. And I was wondering whether, like, if we were writing the sum of function in the zero case as, like, with an as pattern, ah. whether that would make any difference? Yes, yeah. In fact, I lied a little bit. So, um, what corresponds to an as pattern in, in core would be some expression using the case binder, right? So, um, the, 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 the case binder attached to a case expression is kind of like an S pattern because it binds, well, the value of, of the match. Um, and indeed, the code I showed you for sum of isn't actually the way I showed it to you because we will actually previously float out the I hash of zero hash thing to the top level, as we will actually see in um, the issue that we are going to review in a second. You know what, let's, let's first have a short um, introduction to CSE. So, um, so, as you can see, CSE is pretty well commented, as is pretty much any corner of GHC, right? So, the first part is only comments. Um, whenever you hit a new core transformation that you want to get, get insight into, it's a good idea to go to CSE Expo. This is the function basically traversing all expressions and trying to apply CSE as, as, as it sees fit. So, uh, the first thing to note here is that it maps an in expert to an out expert, right? So, what does this prefix mean? Well, it basically means, if you go to the definition, you will see many passes apply substitution. And the, the prefix reminds us of whether or not the substitution has already been applied. So, one very important thing to know about the concept of a substitution within GHC is that a substitution is apply once. You can't apply it multiple times. Doing so is a bug. So, um, right, so this, this guy basically means, well, before the substitution and this guy is after the substitution. So let's have a short look at CSNF. Um, you can see three fields. The first two are the most important ones, right? So this, this guy is actually a substitution. So this is what the documentation and the nomenclature of in and out refers to. And this substitution is exactly the rena renaming substitution I showed you in the slides, right? This is a little clippy, yeah. <laughs> That's a good idea. I am not sure. I think it's called auto hover or something. Oh, auto hover, yeah, perfect, okay. Someone knows cocoon. Oh, there we go. Yes, thank you. Ah, oh, much better. <laughs> yeah, so this is, it works quite well when your screen is not so narrow. <laughs> Right, so, um, a substitution. Th this guy is the renaming substitution, um, and this guy is the reverse mapping, aptly named as such. It's a, it's a core map, but this core map guy is just a fancy way of saying I'm a map from core expert to A, right? And in this case, it maps to an out expert. Oh, also, substitution normally maps to out experts as well, right? It's an expert, but with the unwritten invariant that these out experts they map to, they are always trivial, right? So they are mostly variables, I guess. Um, this last field is pretty unimportant because it only applies to recursive bindings. I, I mean, it's unimportant to us right now. Um, right, going back to CSE expert, where is this, what? Yeah, okay. I guess it always activates again when I do jumping, whatever. So. Um, we are now in CSE expert. So what does CSE expert do? What does CSE expert do? CSE expert do? Well, when it encounters a type or a coercion, um, which, by the way, only occurs in an argument position and maybe on the right-hand side of a let. That's why we need these constructors. Um, we simply substitute them. A literal is kept as is. When we hit a variable, we apply the substitution, right? So the union find, so to speak. This is basically the find operation of the union find. Um, when we have an application, we recurse into the head. But when we have an argument, we, we invoke try for CSE. Huh. Well, I mean, if you look at CSE expert, this is just a recursive function that traverses 
the structure of the expression, but it does not actually apply the reverse mapping. So if you don't do if you don't apply the reverse mapping, what you've done basically is just renamed all binders. So try for CSE, what does it do? Well, basically it tries to, well, it first calls CSE expert on the expression, and then on that expression it does some tick-related stuff, unimportant, and then it tries to apply the reverse mapping. So it first recurses, then applies the reverse mapping, which is great because we will need this function later on. Right, um, in the interest of time, let us skip straight to lambdas. So this is the question, this, this relates to what Ben asked, right? So um, whenever we do substitution or reason about binders, we need to carry around the in scope set and uh, a substitution is a convenient way to rename stuff as you go. So for example, um, when we hit a lambda binder, this, this outer B, right, this B might shadow an existing free variable that is part of our in scope set. And when we hit such a binder, we will, oh, we will look up, so let me quickly look, uh, look at, at binder. So this is, this is a function on substitutions here. So what this guy does is basically it looks up whether v is part of the in scope set. And if so, it will return a fresh variable, right? It can, since it knows all in scope variables, it can simply pick a variable that is not in scope. Simple as that. Of course, that means that the in scope set must not be too small. I suggest you read the documentation on substitutions. Um, there is an entire set of invariants about substitutions which are very subtle, to say the least. Right. Um, CSE bind will do something similar. It will also um, actually add the mapping. I'm, yeah, I don't need rec, I need the non-rec case, in which case we call CSE bind, right? And now it's the third case, right? So the important part is this call to extend CSN with binding. This guy, depending on whether or not the right-hand side is triv trivial, will add to the reverse mapping, or it will add to the substitution, right? And this is the check that, that actually does the check, right? So um, we use the substitution whenever the right-hand side is a variable, such as C in our example. Um, this is important for reasons that become apparent when we look at the actual issue that we are facing, uh, which is related actually to CSE case. So, without further ado, let us actually review the issue that we are going to fi try to fix. So, in this case, we have a function. So, first off, this function here is just a hidden identity function, right? It does some scrutinization on n, but of course, both branches return n, so it's just the identity function, and uh, the simplifier is actually smart enough to spot that these alternatives are the same. So we get the identity function. This is STG, but I, get, I think you get the gist. Um, this, the, the, the same does not happen if you write 2 here instead of n. So this set has the same semantics, but it's just a little bit different syntax. And what happens is basically that um, after simplification, we get a nested case sequence here, as you would get when you na naively desugar it, except there is also another problem, in parentheses, namely then uh, that G1 is floated to the top level, right? So the application to iHash was floated to the top level, where it's not easy to spot that you could actually identify these two uh, alternatives. Right, so, and um, Simon helpfully identified the culprit here, and he also proposed two ways to fix it, either in CSE or the simplifier, and we will quickly review how to fix it in CSE. Um, yeah, I guess the proper way would be to, um, oops, the proper way would be to have a test case, right, uh, which could look like, like something like this here and actually move it to the right directory. Um, in the interest of time, I will skip over that part. But um, so our G function looks like this. A light color scheme for people in the... Yes, exactly. Thank you. Late. Ten more minutes. 
Yes. Yes. I think that that should suffice on the fast path. Right. So this was g. Um, before we fix g, we need to fix another function, which is named k. Um, and k actually operates not on on an int, which is which has an ihash data constructor with a primitive literal, but instead has a data constructor O carrying another data, another, another data type instead of a literal, right? So this is not a primitive. This is a, this is O. Uh, this is an ordering. So short reminder: ordering is either LT, eq, or uh, GT. And now we can write K in the following way. Um, oh, this should be O of LT. So this is pretty similar to the disjugate form of the met pattern match on two above, right? Right, so if we write this, we can notice that we actually get um, similar results. And because there are two issues actually with this code, or with our transformation, we can learn a lot by finish or by, by um, fixing k first. So these k wrap bindings, by the way, are those dreaded typable binds, which make it hard for me to parse. Yeah. Okay. Right. Here we are. So as you can see, we also float out a k1 binding, um, which you can see here. Let me review how CSE handles this case binding. So we have something like blah, and then we have k of o of n is equal to case n of wild one. Yeah, whatever. I can probably faster, it's probably faster to simply copy and paste from here. Right, something like this. Okay, so what CSE does is basically it, re it maintains a reverse mapping and the substitution, right? And at the beginning, both are empty. And when we encounter this case binding here, right? Imagine we are in this position then what happens is that we treat the wildcard binder as if it's right hand side, as if it was a let binding where its right hand side is n. So what happens, because the right hand side is trivial, is we extend the substitution with a mapping from wild x1 to n awo, right? Then we go, let me quickly copy this code because then we can transform it on the go. Then we are at, right? The next position where something happens is here, after we've entered the case alternative, which means we will add, so this is a summary of the code that CSE case does. Um, here CSE will add a mapping from this expression to this binder, right? So um, inside the case alternative of O, we know that O to apply to blah is equal to N A W O. Then we move further inwards. Um, yeah, the wildcard binder here is dead, so I won't. Uh, I won't do anything to it. I don't add a mapping to it. So now here, here is the first occurrence, uh, or the, the first place where we actually apply our substitution. We transform to A W O, right? Because this is this is the substitution that we carry around, right? And in the other case, we've got another local equality that we can make use of, which is added to the reverse mapping, namely um, that LT in this particular case alternative is equivalent to DS DMG. Right, so when we are here, we've got a problem because we can't uh, we, we, we can't go any further. So the first thing that we would need to implement is looking through the unfolding of K1, right? So if we did that, we could inline, so to speak, the unfolding, and we would arrive at this code, and then we could apply 
the we'd get a match in the reverse mapping in the argument here to um, ds dmg, and then this guy matches, and it all cascades back into n a w o, and then the combine identical alts function of CSE will detect well this is equivalent to this, and we can optimize it. Right. So this is the first part we need to um, implement looking through unfoldings. The way we do this is basically we tweak the variable case, um, extract a function named CSE var that, among other things, does n for v. So in the, this is, we haven't done anything yet, right? So this is the otherwise case, but uh, the interesting part is when we want to look through the unfolding um, and the way we do this is we first test that we actually have an ID because non-IDs don't have unfoldings and then we match on the unfolding template, expand unfolding maybe, so this, you've just got to know these functions and or search for them for long enough to find them, as in my case, and now, so this tumple thing, this is the, the right hand side stored in the unfolding and what we do to it is basically we do um, apply try for CSE this tumble thing and um, yeah let's see right um, and if that worked we can just return E right something like this um, so, very basically like this, and if we build this, so HBF is just one of my aliases, it's basically Hadrian build and free stage one compiler. Should probably have written it out. Oh. Core bind. Ah yeah, okay, I know what's going on. I completely forgot to pass arguments to CSE var, obviously, right? Uh, I'm in the wrong. Yeah, and hopefully after this, we should be able to see the change. A very frustrating thing about Hadrian is that it takes so long to even start to build. All right, so let's click quickly review with force recomp that we've ac actually accomplished something here and then call it the day. Uh, where is it? Right, so this is our K function. K is now the identity function. We've won. Hooray. 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 So we've <laughs> fixed half of the issue. At least we think so. Because actually it turns out that if you go through with this and improve CSE, there are actually two issues with each of those fixes. That means that we should have rather fixed it in the simplifier. But, well, at least we tried. So, thank you all for listening and uh, staying for me 20 minutes longer than planned.